الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله أرسله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا ثم أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وإن كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار يقول الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وإذ قال موسى لقومه اذكروا نعمة الله عليكم إذ أنجاكم من آل فرعون يسومونكم سوء العذاب يذبحون أبناءكم ويستحيون نساءكم وفي ذلك بلاء من ربكم عظيم وإذ تأذن ربكم لئن شكرتم لأزيدنكم ولئن كفرتم إن عذابي لشديد وقال موسى إن تكفروا أنتم ومن في الأرض جميعا فإن الله لغني حميد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله واللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين ثم أما بعد The Quran on many many occasions speaks about the plight of the Israelites Banu Israel and there are many chapters of their history that are included in several surahs of the Quran, famously Surah Al-Baqarah, but many other places as well. What I want to share with you today are three ayat that belong to Surah Ibrahim uh, and some lessons from them that have to do with the history of the Israelites. Allah, what, what He does sometimes is He takes a very small scene from this long history, that this thousands of years of history of the Israelites, centuries and centuries, and then he takes a small scene and gives us timeless guidance from that one small scene. And so he does that in these ayat. And this is a scene of the Israelites having escaped Egypt. They've been under persecution for many generations now. And they've been kept as a slave race. Uh, what that means is they live in ghettos. They live in this kind of sub, you know, subprime kind of housing or substandard housing. And they are in a military encampment. In other words, they can't just go outside whenever they feel like it. There's military presence outside and they have to go by their permission. On the one side of it, they're landlocked because they're security checkpoints. They can't just go wherever they want. And the, the soldiers force them to go do labor. Men, women, children. You can imagine young men watching their parents being whipped and beat as they're doing work. And they can't do anything about it. And if they open their mouth, there's slaughter that takes place. And he, he's, he's keeping the slave population under control. And on the other side of it is the river. And the river flows towards the palace. So if they try to escape by water, they'll end up towards the palace. So there's no way for them to get out. They're completely locked and stuck in this situation for many generations. And of course, it's a limited space. And you also have to understand, uh, Fir'aun is a political, he's evil, but he's also a political genius. So he understands that if he keeps this population under control, and they're obviously going to have children. And among those children will be men and there will be women. And women, men make good labor. But when these boys grow up, enough of them, they're going to be, when they're teenagers or 20 years old or whatever, they're going to be hot-headed. So when they see their sister being harassed or their mother being slapped, if there are enough of them, there might be a revolution. They might stand up against him. So he understands that he has to control, he needs the slave labor, but he can't have too many of them. Because they they might revolt and throw over the whole country and end his kingdom. So even though there's the biblical analysis and some have in the Quran tafsir have also accepted that, that view that he saw a dream that someone from those children is, is going to th overthrow his empire. I'm also giving you kind of a political backdrop to why he's having those nightmares. You know, he's having those nightmares because if there's enough of them, they will th overthrow his empire. Some, one of them will rise and the others, you, can't, you can only suppress people so much until they can't take it anymore. So his policy became every other year, he's going to slaughter all the boys. His, and they would commit this mass genocide of children and throw the corpses in the river. That's what they would do. And this, this is how the Israelites lived for a long time. So you know, uh, uh, you can imagine the sorrow of one grieving mother. One grieving father. But can you imagine the sorrow of an entire nation that's grieving? The kinds of woes and cries that are happening. Can you imagine the scene of soldiers going door to door and doing this? This is how these people lived. 
and lived like this for a very, very long time. And so when Allah Azza wa finally opened the doors for them, which is a long story, how did He open that door for them? But that's not the scene today. The scene is not that. I'm just giving you a little bit of background so you appreciate where, where we are. Allah Azza wa Jal opens that door, the water parts. It's impossible to cross because they can't escape anywhere. Where are they going to go? The river is going to lead them right back to the military that's trying to kill them. But Allah Azza wa Jal opens the water for them. And now they have a way to escape, miraculously. And they escape. And Allah Azza wa Jal, you know, he, he, he drowns the Pharaoh and his armies. But now where are they? That's the next question. This entire huge population of people is in the middle of the desert. Men, women, children... Huge, and they've left their home behind, they can't pack everything that they owned. You know, put yourself and myself in that situation, our families, our kids in that situation. They're outside in the burning desert, there's no shade to be found anywhere. And fine, we didn't get killed by the Pharaoh, and we didn't get shot down by the spears, and we didn't drown in the river, but now we're going to die of starvation in the desert. And there's this restless, huge population, and its leader is Musa alayhi salam. And he has to now, now what do we do? We don't have a country, we don't have a home, we have nothing. What are we going to do? And so at that moment, Musa alayhi salam gives them a speech. He addresses them. And he is now going to give this population a sermon about how they need to handle this situation, this crisis situation. He says, وَإِذْ قَالَ مُوسَى لِقَوْمِهِ اذْكُرُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ إِذْ أَنْجَاكُمْ مِنْ آلِ فِرْعَوْنِ if some have used here as mubasharatan, meaning Musa salam says to his people, make mention of Allah's favor on you from the very moment he's re now that he's rescued you from the, the Pharaoh and his entire legacy, his entire descendants. Now that you've escaped, make mention of Allah's favor. Now these people are thinking, make mention of Allah's favor. When you, when you and I think of Allah's favor, we think we have food, we have clothing, we have a car, we have a job, we have... We have luxury in life. These are Allah's favors. So he decides to mention Allah's favors to them. What favors of Allah should you remember that you should be grateful? So he says to them, يَسُومُونَكُمْ سُوءَ الْعَذَابِ the, the pharaohs and his people that used to humiliate you with the worst kinds of humiliation. Blacken your faces. What that means is tarring your faces. You know, in old cultures to put tar on the faces to humiliate somebody. In other words, to have no honor for your family, for the women of your family, the soldiers would do whatever they want. This is what you used to suffer. يَسُومُونَكُمْ سُوءَ الْعَذَابِ يُذَبِّحُونَ أَبْنَاءَكُمْ They used to slaughter, massacre. It's not يَذْبَحُونَ إِذْ يُذَبِّحُونَ They used to massacre your sons. وَيَسْتَحْيُونَ نِسَاءَكُمْ And they would allow your women to live. Because they'll produce more later. And for unthinkable reasons also. يَسْتَحْيُونَ نِسَاءَكُمْ the confusing thing about this ayah so far is, he said, make mention of what? Allah's favor. Make mention of Allah's favor. The fact that they were humiliated, the fact that their children were being slaughtered, the fact that their daughters were being allowed to live, doesn't sound like favors. That sounds like some pretty bad stuff. But the commentary began, make mention of Allah's favor. Which favors? These favors. How can these be favors? The fact is, we're overlooking one thing, إِذْ أَنْجَاكُمْ He rescued you from all of this. That's the favor of Allah. This is what you were in. He got you out of this, and this, and this. And that is Allah's favor. What happens is, when someone's in a crisis, what they see in front of them is the problem that they have right now. These people are seeing the desert in front of them, starving and dehydrating babies in their arms. They're seeing the fact that they have no home. Where are they going to find food? Where do, you, where do you find food in the desert? Where do you find water in the desert? You can't turn back either. What, what are you going to do? So you're in the middle of the storm. You're in the middle of this life and death situation. You can't think of what, how can this be a good thing? And Musa alayhi salam first says, listen, as bad as this is, there was something far worse. There was something far, far worse that Allah has already pulled you out of. That's Allah, Allah has already taken you out of. The first step in gratitude isn't just to think of the good things Allah has done. Here, Musa alayhi salam is reminding his people and through the Qur'an, all of us, the, a, a step towards being grateful to Allah is to remember the terrible things that have already happened that Allah has saved you from, that He's pulled you out of already. This is what, if, you know, so, so 
يذبحون ابناءكم ويستحيون نساءكم وفي ذلكم بلاء من ربكم عظيم and that was a massive trial for you in other words this is nothing compared to what happened before this is this is that was a huge trial and look at how Allah even rescued you from that you the the favor of getting out of the hands of the most powerful ruler in history without an army you know how can you escape as a people from the clutches of the most powerful military wa fir'auna dhil awtad alladhina taghaw fil bilad not just balad al bilad they used to take over whatever nation they want nobody messed with them their armies were well established pegged into the ground there is no way for a civilian population to escape and allah got you out of there through impossible odds why are you being ungrateful why are, why are you being ungrateful you should not be ungrateful first of all make mention of allah's favor upon you and then the next but that okay fine i'm grateful thanks for the sermon i'm really grateful now that doesn't solve my problem i'm still dying of thirst my baby's still crying you know the old people don't have a place to even sit down where are we going to live we're going to die grateful i suppose what do we do with this we should we're expecting from musa alayhi salam now to give a khutbah about sabr you're in a difficult situation anybody who's going through a difficult situation you turn to them and say you should have what patience this is what's required at the time what is musa alayhi salam sermon wa if ta'adhana rabbukum la in shakartum la azidannakum when your master remember the moment that your master has declared he's made you open your ears to this announcement that if you were to be grateful i will absolutely i promise it i will increase you increase you and increase you the khutbah he gave is not about being patient the khutbah he gave is about being grateful he didn't say if you're patient allah will solve your problem he said if you're grateful if you're grateful but he didn't even say if you're grateful allah will make a way out for you like other places in quran he says waman yattaqillah yaj'al lahu makhrajan whoever has taqwa of allah allah will make a way out for them allah will give them an escape not in this ayah it's not even an escape but you know cuz when when a person is in difficulty and all you and i can think of is how do i get out of this mess how do i get out of it how do i get out of this pain how do i come out of the hospital how do i come out of this legal thing how do i come out of this problem or that problem that's all you can think of right now allah azza wa jalla gives him a promise if you can show the least bit of gratitude shakartum the maadi i won't get technical it's a khutbah but to say that if you can even show a single instant of gratitude in the middle of a crisis if you're in trouble and you're in di- you're in dire situations you're in desperate situations and you can show that you are grateful to allah in those moments what will allah do as a response because it is at that time before i tell you what what allah promises it is in those moments that a human being we're just human what can we do we are overwhelmed with thoughts about our problems all we can think about is what more is going to go wrong what is going to become of this how is it going to get worse what is how about this and how about this and these scenarios are playing in your head and you're overrun by these scenarios you're just thinking about you know bad and then bad and then bad and it's just mutarakim it's just point you know compiling compounding one on top of the other and your thoughts are invaded by the negative you're just invaded by the negative and in those moments when someone says have sabr meaning let your mind attack you let you yourself be self destructive inside of your head and while you're going through that internal pain just take it we have sabr just ah, it hurts but what is what does the prophet musa alayhi salam tell tell these people and what does allah azza wa jalla take from that one snippet that he makes a timeless advice in the moments of that kind of despair you have to take your mind and you have to take your heart and you have to focus it on things that will remind you what you, what you should be grateful for you have to stop thinking about your problem you have to stop thinking about a crisis you have to stop thinking about what's going wrong you have to get get that out of your head get that out of your heart all you're focused on is what should make me grateful because unless you think about you know when people have a problem like for example you lost your job somebody comes up to you how's it going <sighs> alhamdulillah that's not alhamdulillah cuz in your head i lost my job i have like one month's rent left if that i don't even know how i'm going to pay the electricity bill my kids school tuition is coming up i don't know what i'm going to do <laughs> but the islamic thing to say is alhamdulillah so alhamdulillah In other words the tongue is saying something the heart isn't feeling. The heart is not feeling I have lots of reasons to be positive. 
I have lots of reasons to be grateful to Allah. And that compels my tongue to say. Actually, it's more like, I know there's lots of problems, but I guess, I guess Alhamdulillah, somehow. <laughs> somehow. Shakartum here, if you and I can internally, this is, a, this is a mental, it's an emotional, it's a spiritual exercise. Internally, we can actually find something to be grateful for. Find something to be grateful for. And literally what Allah Azza wa Jal did for, for, the, for the Israelites through the words of Musa salam, is He showed them much worse scenarios. Would you prefer that you were still living under, uh, under slavery? Would you prefer to see your mothers being treated that way and your daughters being treated that way still? Would you prefer your, your, your newborn babies and watch their blood spill? Would you, would you prefer that still? Hasn't Allah removed that calamity from you? Has any, isn't there something to be grateful about? If you can't even think of something positive to be grateful about, at the very least you can say to yourself, things could have been a lot worse. Allah kept things from being a lot worse. That you can be grateful for. And that's something nobody else can make you feel. You and I have to feel that for ourselves. But what will Allah do if we feel that? It's not just for you to feel better. Because you know, in, in modern times when you know, when, when self-help books and this kind of psycholo psychological assistance and counseling or whatever, think positive, everything will work out. Just be positive. Yeah, we're like, I'm positive, but I'm still going bankrupt. I'm positive, but I'm still going to jail. So I'm positively going. <laughs> you know, <laughs> what am I going to do with being positive? How is it going to solve my problem? My problems are still right there in front of me. There's no solution. But what does Allah do? Allah says, yes, your problems are in front of you, but Yes, being grateful is about thinking positively. But for a believer, being positive is different from anybody else thinking positively. When a believer is positive, they're grateful to Allah. That's our positive thinking. What does Allah do in return? لَا أَزِيدَنَّكُمْ I swear to it, لَا أَمْ لِجَوَابِ الْقَسَمْ I swear to it, and I, I emphasize, and I emphasize again, and I emphasize again. This is Nun Thaqila, it's called I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I will increase for you. I will enhance for you. I will make more for you. Now that's an ambiguous thing to say. I will increase for you. I will enhance you. I'm telling you, I will enhance you, enhance you, and enhance you. you another way you, you can even think of it is, I'll give you more and more and more. That's what Allah is saying. I'll give you more and more and more. I'll make you more and more and more. But the question is, more what? <laughs> Are you going to give me more and more? Like if somebody says, well, how's it going? What are your hopes with Allah? I hope Allah increases me. And you're like, increases you in what? Weight? Blood pressure? What, what, do you want? what do you want to increase in? You have to qualify it, right? Somebody says, hey, I noticed that you increased. <laughs> what is that? Did you increase in knowledge or patience or you know, weight or facial hair? Or what did you increase in? Unless you qualify it, you don't know. What, you know, for example, even the term increase, it's because it's mubham, there's always the yeez of it. In, in, in Arabic, it's because it's ambiguous, it's, there's a qualifier. Like, Rabbi zidni, Allah increase me. But that's open-ended. Increase me in what? So we say, Rabbi zidni, ilman, in knowledge. We qualify it. In this ayah, Allah says, if you're grateful, if in the middle of crisis you can be grateful, I will increase you, I swear to it, but He doesn't say in what? He doesn't say, لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ sabran. لا أزيدنكم نعمة. He does. He doesn't say I'll increase you in blessings. I'll increase you in patience. I'll increase you in strength. I'll increase you in perseverance. I'll increase you in the reward of the akhirah. I'll increase some some offer. He doesn't qualify the offer because he recognizes you're in the middle of a crisis in which you have all kinds of things that need to be increased. Your personal strength need to, needs to be increased. The blessing of Allah needs to be increased. The presence of angels around you needs to be increased. Protection from Allah needs to be increased. Rewards need to be increased. There are things that need increase around you that can't be limited. And Allah Azza wa in recognition of that says, you show me gratitude and I will increase all the good things around you without limit. And I swear to it, that's what I'll do. But there's another flip side. And he adds, وَلَا إِن كَفَرْتُمْ And if you dare become ungrateful, I'm not saying disbelieve here because it's in ikas of shukr. Right? So the, the translation correctly would be, and if you dare become ungrateful. By the way, those people in the desert have every reason to be ungrateful. They have every reason to complain. Have you seen people standing for a long time in a line, you know, waiting for something, waiting for at the post office or at passport, 
you know, to get a passport or, you know, and people are cutting and it's hot and they're standing there. Some of you take your kids on vacation and sometimes for the ride, there's like a 40 minute line and you're standing there like, <sighs> people are complaining, it's so hot. God, I don't want to do this. I hate Disney, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's when your patience is tested and these are huge numbers of people. That's not an easy circumstance to be in. But Allah says, and if in, even in the middle of this circumstance, if you people choose the path of ingratitude, if you people become people of complaint, then he says, إِنَّ عَذَابِ لَشَدِيدٍ My punishment is really severe. I don't like ungrateful people. But the mercy of Allah in this ayah is that he didn't say, if you're ungrateful, then my punishment is severe. You know when you say if and then, the two things become correlated with each other? If you do this, then I'll do that. He did that with gratitude. If you're grateful, then I'll definitely increase you. La azidannakum. But on the flip side, wa la in kafartum, he didn't say la inna adabi or fa inna adabi la shadi. Not even fa inna adabi. Just inna adabi la shadi. Just remember, my punishment is very severe. In other words, I'm not saying if you're ungrateful in this moment that I'll punish you. But just remember, things could have been a lot worse. Just think of it that way. Think, things could have been a lot worse. Don't choose the path of ingratitude. Don't forget. Because you know, when you think about people, when you think about the world, when you think about money, when you think about society, then all you're thinking about are problems. When you're thinking about Allah, then you can learn to be grateful. People give us a lot of reasons to complain in our life. The world around us gives us a lot of reasons to complain. As a matter of fact, we become a culture of complaining. You can't buy anything without looking at how many people complained about it. Right? You can't take a course in college without looking at a, about a professor and finding out how many people complained about him or her. Or a school or whatever else. We're a culture of complaint. We're not a culture of gratitude. We have to now become people that Allah increases. So Allah says, وَلَا إِنْ كَفَرْتُمْ إِنَّ عَذَابِ لَشَدِيدٍ And finally, I leave you with this. Allah says, I know some people are so lost in their problems, they're like, yeah, yeah, okay, thanks for this whole be grateful thing, but I got, I got bigger issues, you don't understand, okay? You don't know what I'm going through. So keep, keep your speech to yourself. Let me just, you know, sulk in my negativity. Let me just, whatever. Oh, I can't even complain now? Do you know what's happened to me? Do you know what they did? Do you know what this happened? And, and you just like, you vent. And the response to that is, وَقَالَ Musa. Because you can imagine his congregation saying to him, Seriously, you're going to tell us, don't even complain? Not now, okay? Yeah, grateful for what? The sand? Doesn't taste good, I tried. You know, people could complain. And so what does he say? وَقَالَ مُوسَىٰ إِن تَكْفُرُوا أَنْتُمْ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا If you become ungrateful, you all want to complain? Go ahead, keep complaining. And you know what? If everyone on the earth keeps complaining, every last one of them becomes ungrateful. فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَغَنِيٌّ حَمِيدٌ Allah is, Allah is independent. He didn't, need your pray. he didn't need you to be grateful. He's not, he's not you know, offended by you not being grateful and now somehow he's, you, know, you took something away from him. You know, when you do something for someone, you help someone, and then they turn around and insult you, you could get offended. Like, I did all this for you and you do that to me. Allah doesn't do that. Allah Acceptance or acknowledgement, he didn't need any of it. Allah is, Allah is ghani, he didn't need it. He's independent of it. He doesn't care that you didn't show gratitude. It took away nothing from his kingdom. It didn't upset him. The only one you harmed was yourself. And if you're thinking, if you're not going to be grateful, then who's going to thank him? You know, some really obnoxious atheist, atheist attitudes are, why does your God want us to thank him all the time? Why is he so ma'adullah? They say he's so, so self-centered. You know what they do? They think of people and they imagine Allah would be like that. Because a person who always thinks people should appreciate me, people should thank me, people should praise me, is an arrogant, self-centered person. And they think about people and then they imagine Allah must be like that too. You cannot impose who, what creation is and then impose those thoughts on Allah. لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ What does Allah say about himself? Hamid. فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَغَنِيٌّ Hamid. Allah is praised, Allah is thanked in and of Himself. Even if there was no creation in existence that didn't praise Him, He would still be Hamid. His Hamd would still be there. 
his praise and his gratitude would still be there if there was no one left to praise him. That's not the point. You're not doing this for Allah. You know, the shaitan comes and tricks you. Yeah, you're going through problems and Allah wants you to thank him. Sure. Why should I do that for Allah? What did Allah do for me? That's what a person will say. That's what a person will say when influenced by shaitan. What should I, why should I do this for Allah? What has he done for me? Every time I prayed, I prayed, I prayed, and look where we are. As a matter of fact, the followers of Musa alayhi salam, even before they crossed the desert, because the water hadn't parted yet, you know what they said to them? To him, you know, Udina, we were, we were being tortured before you got here. And thanks a lot. After you got here, we're still in trouble. What's the point? <laughs> what, thanks a lot. Just new problems now. Like they, they didn't see the point. Why should I turn to Allah? It's not like my problems disappeared. And Allah responds, if you want to be ungrateful, go ahead. My promise is I will increase you. But increase you on His timetable, not yours. It's not going to happen when you want it to happen. Allah has a schedule for when He's going to increase you. How He's going to increase you. How He's going to bring you out of your calamity. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us a people of gratitude and not a people of ingratitude. May Allah Azza wa Jal allow our hearts to internalize the teachings of His book. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim. Alhamdulillah wa kafa wa salatu wa salamu ala ibadihi al-ladhi nastafa khususan ala afdalihim wa khatam al-nabiyyin Muhammadin al-Amin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد عباد الله رحمكم الله اتقوا الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون أقم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين